and here we go this is flash at in a perfect world Vinny's off sleeping tonight so we're gonna do probably another solo show for your listening and your reading entertainment hey thanks a lot grim for all the help as usual and we're going to say hey to the bots and bodies probably sleeping there's a few chatters on the rlm right now but it's the middle of the night people we got barman cowboy tech grimner moose girl dc brackets uh, Java Doctor 2, J Dread, Meister Brow, Ponder Gander, Miss Kate, Rome's Vanna White, Vinny, Weather Dork, Phantom Beetle, Cyborg Noodle, Me, Frumpy, Gooberzilla, Gromit, huh, Jays, Nines, Jays, Sock Puppet, and Smotaz. And that's the lineup. So uh, there you go. If you're up and about, you're hearing the show tonight this morning uh there's the folks that you have to entertain your fingertips with on the keyboard and get a little conversation going here on this tuesday the 25th of june 2019 we made it this far we'll probably get a little further if we don't fuck this game up but in the meantime last week i did a story called what is this thing called? Hold on, let me get to the title. Gog, Magog, and the Kingdom of the Khazars. And uh, I only got through part of it. So, I'm going to try to pick up, eventually, I'm going to try to pick up where I left off. Or at least if I didn't, I'm pretty close. But it was a, a lengthy little link about the, uh, the reality of the Jews where they came from, what they're doing, why they're doing it. And it's overall, it's not real specific, but it gives you enough information to doubt the official story that we all live with right now. Because uh, the Noahide laws are coming, and Congress is insane. The voters are even worse. The people that seem to willingly and openly support this crazy freaking shit we live in every day. Uh, some of the politicians aren't stand. They're they're dodging in Oregon. Vinny was all over this. They're uh, they're dodging the vote. They don't want to be held captive, to be forced to give them enough bodies in the, I guess in the situation, to force a vote that the guys that left guys and gals, they don't want to vote. So oh, wow. Instead of being adults now they're they're running off to other places and hiding and the governor's threatening to hunt them down and bring them back and just your general american stupid force and control issues we we live with them uh, over here i suppose but on such a small scale compared to uh where i'm from it's just huge anyway let me get back to my epic saga of Jewy Junus all over the world. And this chapter was called The Khazar Kingdom's Conversion to Judaism. Uh, a warrior nation of Turkish Jews must have seemed to the Western rabbis as strange as circumcised unicorn. A. Dot Kostler. Now, according to Benjamin Friedman, the Khazars' conversion to Judaism was first precipitated by their monarch's abhorrence of the moral climate into which his kingdom had descended. Friedman has claimed, and other historians confirmed, that the primitive Khazars engage in extremely immoral forms of religious practices among them phallic worship animal sacrifices were also included in their rites well, it sounds like the normal ship they do today just they've gone from sacrificing little animals to you know, sniffing kids and other stuff okay back to the story the Khazar religious structure centered around a shamanism known as tengri which incorporated the worship of spirits and the sky as well as zoolatry, the worship of animals, 
Tengri was also the name of their immortal god who created the world. And the primary animal sacrifices made to his deity were horses. The actual mechanics of the Khazarian kingdom's turn to Judaism was, most historians agree, rather well thought out from a humanistic perspective at least, rather than random and capricious as some have believed. Tell you guys, all this shit, everything that we do and see is all part of a plan. It's not happenstance and, oh, look what happened over there. No, these things, hmm. whatever happens in life, happens in life. It's not happenstance in life for a reason. <laughs> anyway, according to George Bernardeski, Ver, wait, Vern, uh, Bernadsky. <laughs> Any, some of these names are just so rare. In his book, A History of Russia, in AD 860, a delegation of Khazars were sent to Constantinople, now known as Istanbul. Which, that's in Turkey. Which was then what remained of the ancient capital of the old Roman Empire turned Christian under the empire, per, 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 Constantine, their message was, <coughs> <coughs> boy, this is going to be hard. We have known God, the Lord of everything, referring here to Ten Tengri, from time immemorial. And now the Jews are urging us to accept their religion and customs, and the Arabs on their part, draw us to their faith, promising, promising us peace and many gifts. This appeal and all its implications was obviously made for the purpose of drawing the Christian Roman Empire into the debate with an eye perhaps toward a, a balanced argument amongst the major monotheistic religions. Hold on, let me see how I'm doing on this here. Ta-da-ta-ta. Yes, I am live and, whoa, working. Wow, this is some really weird stuff, man. Okay, <clears throat> Brooks makes the observation that this statement reveals that the Jews were actively seeking converts in Kazaria in 860. I guess that would be B.C. or no, maybe A.D. Didn't mark it. He also adds that in the year 860, Christian saints Cyril and Methodius were sent as missionaries to the Khazars by the Byzantine Emperor Michael III. Since the Khazars had requested that a Christian scholar come to Khazaria to debate with the Jews and Muslims, inasmuch as the world has seldom or perhaps never witnessed any culture of people more adept at the art of religious debate than rabbinical Jews. The Khazar's conversion to Talmudic Judaism is not a surprising outcome, given that such a forum was to be the determining factor in their choice, rather than purely spiritual perceptions. The outcome was even further assured by the fact that the Christian representatives in the debate came from a church in the late, in the latter formative years of the Holy Roman Empire, in which, by that time, spiritual sensitivity had become somewhat rare to nearly extinct. Wow, see, and the way I look at it, that's the way it is, really. People don't have a freaking clue they just repeat stuff that other people tell them. And when you're familiar with what the other guy says, whether you agree with him or not, you can't really disagree because then comes the rain from all the shepherds. <laughs> anyway, back to the epic story of the Jewy Junus that surrounds us. It was at... That period of time, about A.D. 740, that King Bulan of Khazaria was reputed to have been converted to Judaism. In the debate amongst the Islamic mullah, 
the Christian priest and the Jewish rabbi each presented to the king the advantages and truths of his own precepts of faith. This king, however, according to some accounts of history, had his own logic for determining which he should embrace. He asked each representative in turn, which of the other two faiths he considered superior. The result was that the Muslim indicated Judaism over Christianity, and the Christian priest chose it over Islam. The king then concluded that Judaism being the foundation upon which both of the other monotheistic religions were built would be that which he and his subjects should embrace. The Khazars, themselves being monotheistic, had also apparently expressed reservations about the polytheistic nature of the Trinity doctrine of the Christians. So as not to exclude the Islamic account of these events, the following is taken by D. M. Dunlop from All Bakri's mm, 11th century work, The Book of Kingdoms and Roads. The reason for the conversion of the king of the Khazars, who had previously been a heathen, <laughs> to Judaism was as follows. He had adopted Christianity. Then he recognized the wrongness of his belief and began to speak with one of his governors about the concern with which he was filled. The other said to him, O king, the people of the book from three classes... Invite them and inquire of them. Then follow whichever is in possession of the truth. So he sent to the Christians for a bishop. Now there was within, uh, with him a Jew skilled in debate who disputed with the bishop, asking him, What do you say about Moses, son of Amram, and the Torah which was revealed to him? The other replied, Moses is a prophet, and the Torah is true. Then said the Jew to the king, He has admitted the truth of my creed. Ask him now what he believes. So the king asked him, and he replied, hmm, I say that the Messiah, Jesus the son of Mary, is the word, and that he has made known the mysteries in the name of God. Then the Jew said to the king of the Khazars, He confesses a doctrine which I know not, while he admits what I set forth. But the bishop was not strong in bringing proofs, so he invited the Muslims. <laughs> and they sent him a learned and intelligent man who understood disputation. But the Jew hired someone against him who poisoned him on the way so that he died. And the Jew was able to win the king for his religion. Kostler presents an interesting alternative to these views. His position was that the king's ver conversion was essentially a political decision. Hmm. At the beginning of the 8th century, he writes, the world was polarized between the two superpowers <laughs> re representing... <coughs> Christianity, and, and Islam. Their ideological doctrines were wielded to power politics pursued by the classical methods of propaganda, subversion, and military conquest. And you can't have your cake and eat it too, people. <laughs> you got to give a little to get something. Anyway, back to the epic tale. It may be observed here that it is Quite evident, modern Christianity has well learned this same form of statecraft, propaganda, subversion, and military conquest, inasmuch as they have torn a page directly from the first millennium history of the church. The most violent group of lion thieves on the planet, any organized freaking religion. My bias to anybody that understands what this crap truly is, is dodge it. Stay away from the indoctrinated religious lunatics. They will fuck you up 
and blame you for you fucking getting fucked. It's just a mess. Anyway, back to the epic tale. Uh, the Kassar Empire represented a third force. Kostler continues. Ah, Kostler, Kessler. I can't. I don't know how to say his name. Which had proved equal to either of them, both as an adversary and an ally. But it could only maintain its independence by accepting neither Christianity nor Islam, for either choice would have automatically subordinated it to the authority of the Roman Emperor or the Caliph of Baghdad. Although they suffered no want of protracted efforts by either Islam or Christianity to convert the Khazars to their respective religions, it resulted in no more than an exchange of political and dynastic courtesies, i.e. intermarriages and shifting military alliances, etc. It was clear that the Khazars were determined to preserve their supremacy as a third force in the world, an undisputed leader of the countries and tribal nations of the Transcaucasus. <laughs> They saw that the adoption of one of the great monotheistic religions would confer upon their monarch the belief of both prelatic and judicial <laughs> authority that their system of shamanism could not, and that the rulers of the other two powers clearly enjoyed. J.B. Burry concurs, there can be no question, he says, that the ruler was actuated by political motives in adopting Judaism. To embrace Mohammedanism would have made him the spiritual dependent of the caliphs. So who attempted to no oh, it wasn't didn't say so. Who attempted to press their faith on the Khazars and in Christianity lay the danger of his becoming an ecclesiastical vassal of the Roman Empire. Judaism was a reputable religion with sacred butch books which could, which both, <laughs> this is so hard to read, Christian and Mohammedan respected. It elevated him above the heathen barbarians and secured him against the interference of caliph or emperor. Hmm. So he used the third one as a wedge between the other two. Huh. Politics and religion. See, just juggling shit to get your way so that people will believe you when you don't even know what you're talking about. It would be illogical, however, to think that the Khazarian rulers had embraced Judaism blindly without intimate knowledge of what they were accepting. They had encountered the faith numerous times throughout the preceding century. <laughs> Everybody lives that long. From traitors and refugees fleeing persecution at the hands of the Romans and, to a lesser degree, Jewish flight from the Arab conquests of Asia Minor. Benjamin Friedman expresses differently the science behind the process of choosing a national Khazarian religion. He claims they were much more informal and random and not nearly so intellectual in their approach. It matters little what the mechanics were of the conversion of the Khazar kingdom to Judaism. It matters only that it happened, and that it happened with a clanging historical ring that resounds to the present age. The religion of the Hebrews, writes John Burry, had exercised a profound influence on the creed of Islam, and it had been a basis for Christianity. It had been scattered Prosel, proselytes. Hmm. But the conversion of the Khazars to the undiluted religion of Jehovah's is unique in history. Uh, see, I'm so unfamiliar with all this shit, it's hard to read. Um, it is indeed a unique historical event, as Burry claims. However, it is also interesting that he should refer to their conversion to Tomatic Judaism. Blah as to the undiluted religion of Jehovah. It is evident that present-day Ethiopian Jews would disagree with Mr. Burry on this matter, since they do not adhere to the principles, or to the precepts, of the Talmud. 
Mishnah, Midrash, or any of the extra biblical writings that have arisen since the close of the Old Testament canon. These Jews of North Africa claim only Torah as their scriptural authority, and unlike their distant brothers of the Talmud, they practice their religion quietly and with relatively no involvement in worldly politics. See? According to an ancient document entitled King Joseph's Rally, Re Reply to Hesday Ibn Shaprit, Joseph, a later Khazarian king, stated that, from that time on, the Almighty God helped him, King Bulan, and strengthened him. He and his slaves circumcised themselves, and he, wow, sent for and brought wise men of Israel who interp Israel, what? who interpreted the Torah for him and arranged the precepts in order. Well, this is kind of misleading. There was no Israel back in those. Israel's uh, an invention of the modern-day thinking political guys. They're brilliant. They figured this shit out and slapped us all equally. Hmm. There appears to be as many historical accounts as to how King Bulan was converted to Judaism as there are historians and mystics to present them. Many of them involve visions of angels, such as the tale by a Sephardic Jewish philosopher detailing a dream in which he, an angel told the king that his intentions are desirable to the creator. But the continued observance of shamanism was not in the aforementioned document. King Joseph's reply, its author claims that in that same dream, God promised King Bulan that if he would abandon his pagan religion and worship the only true God, that he would bless and multiply Bulan's offspring and deliver his enemies into his hands and make his kingdom last to the end of the world. Wow, this stuff is insane. It is believed by scholars that the dream was designed to stimulate the, convent, the covenant of in Genesis and meant, it, <laughs> meant to imply that the Khazars too claimed the status of a chosen race, ah, who made their own covenant with the Lord, even though they were not descended from Abraham's seed. Wow, this is too much. Can't, I'm sure glad there's no... Um, chat room to deal with because this is hard as hell for me to read i don't believe or maybe i understand some of it but not all of it some of these names and words are just elusive you know because uh if you, i guess if you do what you're told by an angel <laughs> the people that you hold hostage to support you financially will love you long time anyway back to the epic tale King Joseph corroborates this in his document as he claims to have po positively traced his family's ancestry back, not to Shem, the father of the Shemites, or Semite peoples, but to another of Noah's sons. Though a fierce Jewish nationalist proud of wielding the scepter of Judah, Kessler says he cannot and does not claim for them Semitic descent. He traces their ancestry to Noah's third son, Japheth, I don't know, or more precisely to Japheth's grandson, Togarma, the ancestor of all Turkish tribes. Kessler adds a footnote to King Joseph's genealogical claims that it that is piercingly relevant to this study. It also throws a sidelight on the frequent description of the Khazars as the people of Magog, Magog, hmm. according to Genesis 10 to 3, was the much maligned uncle of Tagorma. Add to this that two of two other of the sons of Japheth, the <laughs> progenitor of the Khazars, ah, progenitor, yeah, the guy that put the bone to the lady, uh, are Meshech and Tubal. Central figures in biblical prophecies of the end times. Wow. I, this stuff is too funny. 
Okay, Kessler adds a footnote. Oh, anyway. King Joseph's reply also revealed that the successor to King Bolin has his son, Obadiah, reorganized the kingdom and established the Jewish religion properly and correctly, bringing in numerous Jewish sages who explained to him the 24 books, the Torah, Mishnah, Talmud, and the order of prayers. This entrenchment in the Jewish religion outlasted the kingdom itself and was transplanted whole cloth into the Eastern European settlements of Russia and Poland. Whatever the religious machinery and or chicanery that was set in motion to accomplish the task, the consequence is historically undeniable that the Khazarian king was indeed converted to Talmudic Judaism and the temporal consequences of that conversion have rung down through history like a warped and distorted bell answering clearly to prophetic declarations of the last days of Earth's history. Wow. And there's yet there's more. This thing is huge. Huge. I'm going to take a little break and rant about my personal opinions about how we're hijacked in the life that we live by these uh, ancient tales. And, oh, look, uh, they got a book. Hey, they wrote it down. Look at what we got here. God's word in man's hand. <laughs> so, no, you, uh, not for me. No, you know, I know I, I joke around a lot about, you know, my mom was Jewish, makes me Jewish and all this crap. But believing it, you see, there's the, the catalyst that takes you to action. You know, what you believe in your head may not always be what you say out loud. Hmm? Sometimes, when we talk amongst our own, we're chit-chatting about this, that, and the other idea, I think we tend to use words like we, you, I, them, us, shit like that, out of habit. And I don't think the speaker is always agreeing with what they're talking about. But I think as a, a rule of thumb that we're taught to listen to people talking in about a third party as though they had a direct connection to it. And it gives you something to be angry about. Better than, I'm better than you, you moron, you don't know anything. Because that's what we say to each other. So the last couple of shows I was joking around, kind of. But, you know, we have people that believe there's aliens amongst us. We have people believe that UFOs have been to Earth from other places. And they claim they've got proof. I don't have a clue what their proof is. Because the way I look at the word proof, proof is to me the story that made me feel good. And it doesn't have to be true. It just has to uh, hit me in a way that I like. Then it's true, even if it isn't. And I would assume that's how this religion stuff works. You can't prove it. You can't disprove it. It's faith-based. And here we are, you know, electrical energy, physical forms, bouncing off each other like a bunch of idiots. Repeating all the dead ideas of the past that if you look around in your society, they did not work. You know, the, one of the nice things about the place where I'm at, when I go, went to the bar, uh, and I was brand new, it was one of the points that um, Karsten's wife made to me was, we're, we're not a religious um, environment. Religion, no. This is more um, an agnostic. Uh, people, either they don't know, they don't care. Uh, it's not their problem. They don't live like that. And as the time uh, that I've been here has proven is uh, the last thing anybody does in public is bash somebody else for whatever religion that they might assume the person walking around with a towel on their head or um, pamphlets to hand out, you know, that the, the Jesus freaks or the, uh, what do you call those? Uh, the, uh, I can't, I lost it. But they used to knock on the door and people would make a bunch of jokes about them. He uh, hmm. lost them. But another another group of religionites that you know want to invade your territory and help you 
improve your life by seeing things their way. And if you don't see things their way, they're very nice. They're pleasant about it. And they do leave and walk off. Uh, Jehovah Witnesses. Hmm. Lost that one for a minute. But my experience with people in reality has been when I've met an ex-Jehovah Witness, they're not embarrassed about what they did, but they what they do is they let you know that they progressed beyond whatever level of religion they were at at that point. And they don't do that anymore. Well, and most of the time what they do after they're um, split from the religious side is, to me, be more human, you know, more manlike, and live your freaking life so you break a rule, so you break a law. If you don't hurt anyone, any, anyone, blah, 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 anybody else breaking your law, what the fuck does it matter? You know, it, no victim, no crime, but yet we live in, in a society, can, you know, our collectives, wherever the population is huge, they have all these controls and and rules and you must do this and you must do that. And the one line that almost all these uh, civilizations harp on, freedom, you have rats, you have this, you have that. Just don't ever use them. So you have them. This is how they fuck people. <laughs> well, you've got them, but you need our protection from us to use them. You now, Vinny, Vinny's tr been trying to explain that to people on the radio for a long, long time. Uh, I understand it the way he talks about it, I think, because, you know, me and Vinny, we, we associate off the internet together on the, you know, wire, and we go back to Skype where we've had long talks about what we think about this shit. Hmm. And when, uh, when we're doing radio, a lot of times... It's very difficult to uh, read read things you're going to say on the radio and have the idea on hand. I keep notes. Vinny, I don't know what Vinny does. I'm not in the room with him. So I just got to take it for granted that <laughs> he's working off a of memory sometime. You know, because all these links and all this information is overwhelming. There's way too much for any one person to actually absorb of all the crap there is for us to, you know, to know, because we've been, you know, uh, upgraded with the internet. So now you can not only can you be an expert on religion, but you can be an expert on politics, uh, society, uh, finance, you know, all the important things, <laughs> education, the the things that should be free to us. That all these um, successful people have put a price tag on so that if you don't participate your chances of survival are they're marginalized because it moves you away from the system and moving away from the system is a death sentence to some people like myself I chose to uh, abandon the medical completely I don't go to doctors for nothing I have been doctor free since November of 2011, and I might be a rarity, who knows, but the older that I get, the uh, I don't feel any any uh, worse now than I did when I was 50. If anything, I feel better. So, uh, like using the, the Cirque thing as an example, you know, she got me off the greasy meat that I like and the greasy potatoes that I like. And changed my diet. And it took a couple of days and some some fennel. I think it was fennel seeds. But as my body was shifting, because you know I had clogged all up. It's funny how if you run a machine poorly, it will continue to run. It'll just run poorly. And then when you try to make the necessary adjustments to make it run properly, then it goes through some changes. And we're alive. We're physical. So these changes are earmarked with, hey, pain. Pain is an indicator something is either damaged or is in the process of being changed. And you have to have some kind of a, an inside idea about this going into it because, oh, man. 
you can uh, do yourself an equal amount of damage trying to fix something as you can fuck it up. Uh, that just comes from experience, I think. But some folks, they prefer the, uh, you know, the traditional system. This is what we do. Medical people know everything. They've got it all under control. Blah, fucking blah. Now me, I don't, I don't see it that way. I don't think they got control of anything. They have openly for years practicing medicine. They're not, they don't state in any way, shape, or form, except through law, that medicine knows shit. They're, they're very honest in the beginning, and then turned into a bunch of lion sacks of shit. When you uh, get to the point where you require their services, you know. So, hmm. I think for me, the, the whole, the whole of it is to stay healthy enough, uh, where I'm not in agony every day and oh this hurts, no that hurts. Life can do that to you. You can bump your head, you can kick a table in the middle of the night, go into the bathroom. Anything is possible. So I think it's a matter of how I interpret the warning signs or the danger I'm surrounded by. And then how I deal with it. And I I don't feel I deal with things in a traditional, this is what everybody does kind of way. I look at all the opportunities and then I pick the one that makes me happy. <laughs> or sometimes I pick the one that I would assume from looking onto it will give me the result that I am seeking. You know, if I'm looking for something, I'm more likely to find what I'm looking for if I open my eyes and start looking because sitting here, you know, and praying to Jesus for a solution in my mind ain't going to do shit. And it's just thinking and I can think all the time, but thinking without action is what, what are you doing? You're doing nothing, but see, then there's the other side of it, the vibrations and the frequencies and that other level of it, Maybe that's what makes it real to people is they're in tune with the other people doing the thing they're doing. What I do is so unique, as far as society tells me anyhow. Not a lot of people want to do it. Even uh, people that are friendly to me in public, when I speak to them about medicine, politics, religion, or um, <coughs> education, for example... I'll, I'll always get <laughs> whoops a little too hard on the pipe but I'll always get uh, some kind of resistance from the listener and it'll usually be a, a, a non-spoken resistance they'll they'll do something with their eyes or they'll shift their body so that I recognize no you're not into this and that's okay I don't I don't mind being uh disagreed with or mocked or made fun of whatever the fucking case is at the time because the, the ideas that I have that I've adopted from listening and reading and following through with other people's ideas have brought me to the place where I'm at in life today and uh, wow my life isn't based around the traditional shit like finance and uh, the, my status in the, the society that we live in I'm equally uh, welcomed by the suit and tie <clears throat> as I am by the drink and bum. Everybody treats me the same because I treat them all the same. And when you're living in small areas, that's what matters. It's not about politics or religion or any of that crap. Never fil filters down to this. Excuse me. One, let me clear my throat. I got a little tea here I can finish. Give me, give me a second. I will even mute for your listening enjoyment. Because I'm doing the show wifeless today. I don't have anybody to help me out and get through this. I have to do everything all by myself. <laughs> anyway, so I was ranting about how the individual has been lost in the collective over the, the years. You know, you've got to be in a group. you got to pick a side. You have to be part of this religion or a member of that education system. Or maybe you graduated through their, you know, Bullshit, whatever you call it. I don't call it anything. Bullshit. 
I think life has uh, shown me, not you, but me, everything we see is exaggerated nonsense. Uh, <clears throat> all the answers we need are right in front of us on the internet web, but they're hidden behind layers and layers of education, religion, and politics. So, to me, the key to get to the truth was to eliminate those, those three things. Get them out of the way. Stop listening to the dead people that had ideas that did not work. They didn't work. You can see they didn't work. We've got chemtrails. We've got GMO. We've got people uh, willing to have an abortion because you know a kid could, in, it could in, uh, inconvenience their life. Selfishness. You know, not too selfish to take a poke, you know, but too selfish to carry through with what the poke is possibly capable of doing to the pokey. And, you know, everybody wants to blame each other now. The pokers, ah, make the women do it. Ah, the pokey, ah, make the men do it. Do what? You know, why don't you just... Um, <laughs> See, if you're not a victim of this modern-day philosophy shit we got going on about freedom and every fucking group in the world has rights now. That's it. That was the key to the thing. That rights thing finally kicked off and screwed us all eventually. Because, uh, you know, if you've got 10 people that want to dress up in, uh, you know, uh, say, uh, what do you call those things? Flags, uh, colorful flags, <laughs> walk down a boulevard in a G string, you know, petting a, uh, another guy walking on a leash, that's okay. People have rights to be as fucked up in public as they want to. Hmm. But on the other side of that coin, uh, things have just shifted because uh, the normal, whatever normal is, because there is a normal, average, run-of-the-mill, boring, you know, like me. My external might not express that boring you know, old guy that I truly am, but when I'm home, uh, outside of the dog barking or maybe the cat and the dog running around the house chasing each other, that's it. We we don't have a, we don't throw dishes across the house and, you know, what do you got? People that, <sighs> people just do what they fucking want. There's an order to life. There's things that, maintenance, that's the word I was looking for. You need to maintain shit in order for it to correctly function. There you go. And like I was saying before about you can run an engine on bad gas and you can run it for a while and it might run for a long time, but it'll never run at top potential. And I think that's what's going on with us. <gasps> Excuse me. Had a burp coming up there. But we've been hijacked by all these intellectuals and representatives and teachers and religious fanatics that want to guide us to the shit that but they themselves don't do look at on creepy joe sniffing all the little girls oh the catholic church and they paid out enough money and uh, hush money to um, people that were suing them at the turn of this 20th cent 21st century to finance a small country Okay, but they still have starving people supporting them from Africa, Middle East, America. People that don't have a clue tend to support the shit that's in control of their demise. You know, we only got so long on this planet in the first place. And then you never know how long it could be. It could be from one second to what, 110 years, Who you know. And all the places in between. Because we croak. And I think that we've been uh, treating life so cheaply over the last, oh, good Lord. I uh, don't know. Forever, maybe. Uh, people don't have, uh, hmm, they don't try to find the right way to judge this. They don't live up to the pictures that they portray, in my opinion. Everything is just a story. You know, right down to bombing Iran or uh, Syria or granting you the right of free speech. Granting, 
Are you fucking kidding me? Nobody granted me anything. I took it. If I want to talk, I'll talk. If you want to stop me from talking, what are you what are you talking about? It's insanity. So, with that little booger, I'm going to go back to the end. I think I got one more um, jaunty little... Whew, yeah. We're coming up to the last bit of my epic Jewy Junus tale from the uh, Magogs and the Gogs and the all that. Who I lost that name in my mind. The Kazarian Kingdom. Okay. Now, this part's called... The decline of the Khazars and the emergence of the Ashkenazim. Hmm. Never heard any of these names. Most of this stuff is just new to me. So if you're not enjoying the reading, it's because I can't read half of the stuff I'm trying to read. Bear with me. It might get better. <laughs> the Khazarian kingdom reached its peak of power and world influence in the latter half of of the 8th century reached its peak of power and world influence in the latter half of the 8th wow these people are nuts anyway the death knell of their empire was eventually seen in the dragon headed ships of the vikings who were to cross and navigate all the major waterways in their onslaughts even the legendary ferocity of the Khazars was outdistanced by these Norsemen who did not design or did not deign to trade until they failed to vanquish. They preferred blood-stained glorious gold to a steady mercantile profit. They were also called Rus, from which descended, among others, the Russians. Okay, interruption time. When I lived in Kirkwall, Orkney, there's an island chain off the uh, west, northwest coast of Scotland. Um, there was evidence there of, of Nordic trading, and it was all like hair clips, innocent things. There was no uh, sign of, of being invaded that they were talking about. It was all trading. So, even though the Nordics have this reputation for invading and they're talking about, you know, 800, uh, what, A.D.? Come on. You don't know what happened two months ago in another country, but these people that write claim to have all this knowledge and proof. And it's not. It's their idea of what took place. But they managed to write it in a way that when we read it, somehow or another, the brain waves seem to pick it up as some kind of a hey i saw it in print it's got to be true or why would they write it and that in the long run i guess in my opinion is how lies are born they start out with you know a little bit of a truth and then everything after it is just crap so back to my epic tale because uh i have personal opinions by god and country and i'm going to say them and I don't care until they cut me off the radio. I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> because historical Scandinavian literature did not begin until after the time of the Vikings, little of actual fact is known of them, with much of it apocryphal hmm, and contradictory, and almost none of it laudatory. Wow, some of these words are incredible. Of their military powers, however, virtually all accounts are in harmony. In his book, The Magyars in the Ninth Century, C.A. McCartney quotes the Arab historian I.B.N. Rusta. These people are vigorous and courageous, and when they descend on an open ground, on, wait, when they descend on, on open ground and none can escape from them without being destroyed and their women taken possession of and themselves taken into slavery ah see now they just do it with paper now they just get you in debt get a job get a career go to work buy a house there's 30 years right there of indentured servitude for your living exceptional entertainment Okay, 
because <laughs> me and Cirque did it. Um, hmm. Wow. Anyway, that's a whole nother argument. Uh, there was even coined a specific term for the Viking ferocity, Berserksgänger, from which is derived the English word berserk. Such were the prospects, says Kessler, which faced the Khazars, even in light of their viciousness and military prowess. These Norse Vi Vikings focused their pillaging assaults on the Byzantine Roman Empire, which is way south of where I was in Scotland. Okay, Preferring to trade with the Khazars rather than to tangle with them, Though eventually outmatched in ferocity, the Khazars were still able for a while to exact their 10% taxes even from the Vikings on all of their cargo. More correctly spelled plunder that massed, that mass that passed through their land. Whoosh, tongue twisted and smoking at 8 uh, 51 in the AM here in Denmark. Trying to get through this epic tale, but you know what? Wake and bake. I read that every day on the on the uh, RLM. Every day somebody wants to hey wake and bake, and I'm just here to tell you people. Sometimes I do. Anyway, where was I? And an interesting story emerges from this period of the Khazar Empire that gives a clear vignette of the emerging cultural schematic that was eventually to be scattered throughout the world. In 912, here we go again, the Rus Vikings with an armada of 500 ships. Notice 500, not 460, not 513, 500 even ships. It's amazing how they do that. Each manned by 100 warriors were set on invading and plundering the Muslim lands south. Of the Khazars, with whom the Khazars had a loose alliance of protection due to the thousands of loyal Muslims in the Kagan's army. The Rus commander sent a letter to the Kagan asking permission to pass through his territory, to which the Khazar king acceded, acceded on condition of receiving half of the spoils upon their return. <laughs> Boy, that's cheap. Hey, I'll take half, and the Jew is born. Anyway, on the Vikings' return from their bloody mission and paying the tribute required by the Khazars, the Muslims loyal to the Khazarian monarch who lived in the eastern part of his kingdom requested of the Kagan that they be permitted to fight the Vikings in retaliation for what they had done to their brethren to the south. The king granted them permission to do so, which resulted in the complete eradication of the Rus force, except for 5,000 who escaped and were subsequently killed by the Budas and Bulgars to the north. Okay, I'm getting lost in all that. Here pictured, okay, I, don't, I got the picture on the link. So I posted the link already. So uh, I doubt anybody's uh, that's on the RLM. The crew that's on there is not uh, the crew that likes what I do. So I'm just yakking to myself here today. Now, here pictured is a classical perspective of what was to become the Khazar Jewish heritage in nearly all their dealings. Business, social or cultural, a king who becomes a willing through though passive confederate of marauding Rus slash Vikings, claims half of the loot they have taken in their bloody assault, licenses a retributive attack against them by Muslims under his own command, but then informs the Vikings of the imminent reprisal he himself has authorized. The weakening of the Khazar military influence had a very wide and unexpected influence in that it greatly hastened the extinction of the Byzantine Empire. They no longer had a powerful force on their eastern borders to prevent the Vikings, Mongols, and others from invading an already weakened dominion. This and internal fraction, friction, factions with Khazaria was the prologue to the scattering of the Khazar Jewish seed throughout Roman, well, 
throughout Russia and Eastern Europe, and eventually, as shall be shown, to the reshaping of world history. The swan song over the Khazar kingdom was not a precipitous decline in a climactic or decisive series of battles, but rather a gradual evolutionary succumbing to superior forces over a protracted period of time. Kind of like how the um, central bank just fucked everybody in, the, in my lifetime, in my country. And what they did was, it was like a roller coaster. You know, they had <coughs> the, uh, the great stock market crash. <laughs> they had, what else? The Great, <laughs> great Depression. <coughs> well, there's, there's your depression. It came from the crash, right? But it was manufactured by the wealthy. Just like World War II. Just like World War I. Just like everything that's violent. It's like this story is trying to tell you. You know, the bigger something is, the more violent it becomes and it gets greedy and it wants to gobble up everything. It's not happy just with what it has, which is what I've been trying to get across on the radio for a while. It is whatever I've got, wherever I live, however I'm living, is that's okay. I'm not uh I'm not one to oh this isn't good enough, I gotta have that. Ugh. I make the best of what my surroundings um, offer and financially geez there's so much money and so much shit in this world to get and acquire uh, the only pitfall is that that some people sign up for permission from the, the state the government my wife did it my wife doesn't want to live like an outlaw she wants to do it the legal way and, and get through life with as little resistance from these people that can lock you up and throw away the key, so to speak, or punish you financially, it's easier for Cirque to uh, deal with it than it is for her to do it my way and avoid it. So we've compromised and managed to... Uh, she's convinced me when we were first together that she knows what she's doing. And here we are, five years into this game, and she knows what she's doing. So, uh, my, uh, my dependence comes from choosing to stay here and not going home, for those of you that judge me. Because <laughs> in America, I'm free to do whatever I please, because I don't beg the government to allow me to do shit. It's, it's a different world. Okay, back to this epic, and I mean epic, long Magog Gog and the Khazar's Kingdom story. Hmm. All right, where was I? Hmm. The swan song of the Khazar Kingdom was. Oh, I read that. In general, the reduced Khazar Kingdom persevered, says S. W. Baron. It waged a more or less effective defense against all foes until the middle of the 13th century, when it fell victim to the great Mongol invasion set in motion by Genghis Khan. Even then it resisted stubbornly until the surrender of all its neighbors. But before and after the Mongol upheaval, the Khazars sent many offshoots into the unsubdued Slovanic lands, helping ultimately to build up the great Jewish centers of Eastern Europe. Here then remarks Arthur Kessler, we have the cradle of the numerically strongest and culturally dominant part of modern Jewry. The ancient Hebrew nation had started branching into the diaspora long before the destruction of Jerusalem. Eth ethnically, the Semitic, uh, Semitic tribes on the waters of the Jordan and the turco khazar tribes on the Volga were, of course, miles apart. But they had at least two important formative factors in common. Each lived at a focal junction where the great trade routes connecting east and west, north and south, intersect. A circumstance which predisposed them to become nations of traders, of enterprising travelers, or rootless cosmopolitans. Hmm, I like that. Rootless. Maybe I'm a rootless cosmopolitan. <laughs> As 
hostile propaganda as unaffectionately labeled them. But at the same time, their exclusive religion fostered a tendency to keep to themselves and stick together. <laughs> Go figure. To establish their own communities with their own places of worship, schools, residential quarters, and ghettos, originally self-imposed in whatever town or country they settled. This rare combination of wanderlust and ghetto mentality, reinforced by mess messianic hopes and chosen race pride, both ancient Israelites and medieval Khazars shared, even though the latter traced their descent not to Shem, Shemites, but to Japheth. <laughs> you know, and what that paragraph just described to me was L.A. or New Jersey or... Any metropolis where you've got, you know, rich, well, you've got poor. The poor support the rich. The rich don't seem to understand that part. The rich think that, seem, this is my interpretation of all this. Because they got money, they can pay people to do whatever their little heart desires. They can buy whatever they want. And what we do in society is raise people that will do that. There you go. And then there's people like me that, no, I'm not going to do that. Don't support with my own effort, my own in, you know, input, the shit that surrounds us. I only support what's in front of me, what I can put my hands on. And that way of life is accepted by governments and shit. As long as I don't get into their commerce and start making money or begging for money, I'm good. The minute I cross either of those two lines, at that, that point, I am a slave to the system. And that, translating that to other people. Well, you got a passport. You got out of there. Yeah, those, those are IRS documents to follow your financial tradings. They got nothing to do with uh, borders and countries and all that shit. That's why certain countries will just see that American passport and that's it. It's all you need. It pulls the weight. Now, it's not my fault. It's not my choice, but I'm smart enough to use the tools that are in the toolbox. Now, what would I find other people not so um, capable or interested in doing is understanding what the tool truly is. They get secondhand uh, information. <clears throat> you know, from newspapers or the interwebs or other people like I did, and they go with it without, you know, checking it out, test it first, see what happens. And uh, what I learned young was your signature is everything. So be careful of what you sign. People were real clear with me about that. I'd already got my driver's license, so I hadn't learned my lesson. Uh, but when it came to the finance thing, that then I started to pay more attention because I was raised with this uh, driving license thing. I, I didn't know any better, so it was normal to me to beg the state for a license and pass a test and go stand in line and wait and do this and do that and the other. And it took me uh, a few years after that to realize the trap that that truly was for me. Other people, not so much. Uh, some people just live and die by this organized, you know, thievery. Let's let's sign up for their shit, baby, and they'll take care of us when we're old. No, they won't. That that too is another story. Is uh, we we've had the genders pitted against each other for how long? Who knows? I know it from my life. Is old people didn't know anything. And I would say, well, how'd they get old? <laughs> Shut up. We don't talk about that here. So we'll go back to the epic story about this uh, Jewry shit. But wow, what a story. Anyway, this more recent diaspora resulted in a strong, oftentimes politically overwhelming, Khazar slash Jewish influence in especially Hungary and Poland but also in the whole of Eastern Europe. Jews were found in positions of power and political influence in virtually every major category of life. B. 
business, and society. There may have already been a small population of what Kessler calls real Jews living in that region, but there can be little doubt that the majority of modern Jewry originated in the migratory waves of Khazars, who play such a dominant part in early Hungarian history. Yeah, well, like Mary says, you know, history. Ha. Huh. Maybe maybe the dates and the names are right, but most of it's nonsense. Probably most of what I've been reading is truly nonsense, but the points being made behind the story are the that's the intriguing part to me. Not the remember this king and remember that year, but the idea that infiltration is a tool of the people that want power. They're in control. They run us, and we don't know that as a collective. Individually, some people have a real clear perception of it, but you know, when you get more than 150 people in a group, I think the IQ level drops down to the low 60s, and uh, at that point, all you're capable of is either chanting or maybe some kind of random violence, but no good... Okay, you might throw a, a concert or some kind of music thing at me, but outside of a, there's no good to, to jump into a group that big. It doesn't produce anything but waste, in my opinion. So, back to the story. <laughs> the Khazar, wait, I just read that. Western European Jews historically displayed such talent and acumen at trading and as usurers money lenders that in virtually any society and culture in which they found themselves, they became the possessors of and controlling influence over large portions of that nation's wealth. In the Dark Ages, the commerce of Western Europe, wrote Cecil Roth in the 1973 edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, was largely in Jewish hands, not excluding the slave trade, and Jew and merchant are used as almost interchangeable terms. The floating wealth of the country, Roth continued, was soaked up by the Jews, who were periodically made to disgorge into the exchequer. Hmm. Na exchequer? National or royal treasury. Okay. It was evident that the ruling class periodically became intimidated by the mass of their nation's wealth accumulating to the hands of so small a minority, and a very clannish minority at that. This would logically give any ruling authority cause for concern. When a particular group virtually controls the nation ec nation's economics, while at the same time appearing to have a tenuous allegiance to the country in which they reside. Such a course of events eventually, evidently led to the creation of a stereotype and blueprint for Jews and Jewish communities that has been expressed and reacted to in various cultures for centuries. The nucleus of modern Jewry remarks Kessler, thus followed the old recipe, strike out for new horizons, but stick together. This, as previously mentioned, was the course of Western European Jews. But the similarity between them and the Khazarian Jews is striking, especially in their unequaled aptitude at things economical and political. Both illusions to me, but hey. Live the life. The mass of hysterical data has led several historians to conjecture that a substantial part, and perhaps the majority, of Eastern Jews, and hence of world Jewry, might be of Khazar and not of Semitic origin. <clears throat> Boy, I'm losing my throat on this epic tale, too. Sorry, folks. Back to the story. The far-reaching implications of this hypothesis may explain <clears throat> the great caution exercised by historians in approaching the subject, if they do not avoid it altogether. Thus, in the 1973 edition of the Encyclopedia Judaica, the article Khazars is designed by Dunlap, 
But there is a separate section dealing with the Khazar Jews after the fall of the kingdom, signed by the editors and written with the obvious intent to avoid upsetting believers in the dogma of the chosen race. Yeah, chosen race. Abraham N. Poliak, Tel Aviv University's post-war professor of medieval Jewish history, pondered at how far we can go in regarding this Khazar Jewry as the nucleus of the large Jewish settlement in Eastern Europe. The descendants of this settlement, Poliak declares, those who stayed where they were, those who emigrated to the United States and to other countries, and those who went to Israel, constitute now the large majority of world Jewry. Some historians, such as Austrian Hugo Kachera, assert that Euro Eastern European Jewry was not part, but entirely, of Khazarian origin. Huh. Well, see, there that's the good part about an argument. You know, you, you got words. So, somebody says something, and you can say something back. The truth has no fucking play in a story. The truth is just a byproduct. It's, it's, a, it's a detail that most people don't give two shits about. If they did... Israel wouldn't exist, and it wouldn't be doing what it's doing to us right now. But, yet again, another story for another time. Back to this epic tale. This is really good. I'm liking this. I hope you guys are enjoying it, even with me butchering the words. Eight in the morning, stone, trying to read. Maybe not the best plan I could have come up with. <laughs> but uh, I like to experiment with my things that I do. So to my hardcore, which grew, my hardcore 63 out at BitChute, hello, everybody, and if you picked up the end of this uh, epic story that you could have read, well, thanks for supporting the show. <laughs> Back to Tales of Jew. <clears throat> Still further proof that the Jews of European, of Eastern European, Europe, had no origins in the West is Yiddish. The language commonly used by the Eastern Jews. Yiddish was, until the latter part of the 20th century, a dying language. It is an amalgamation of several tongues, primarily Hebrew, and written with Hebrew characters, but which includes much of medieval German and components of other languages like Slavonic. The German elements incorporated into Yiddish have been clearly shown to have originated in the east of Germany, where it joined the Slavonic nation regions of Eastern Europe. Yiddish is a sort of linguistic sponge in that it readily absorbs and incorporates whatever words or idiomatic expressions best suit its purpose. It would therefore naturally have become a cultural marker for whatever region in which it was spoken absorbing the telltale indicators of dialect like a tattoo. Another respected Austrian historian, Mit Mattis, Mattis Yohu, Mises, Mises? <laughs> those are great names. Could it be that the generally, generally, the generally accepted view, according to which the German Jews once upon a time immigrated from France across the Rhine, is misconceived. Mises, who knew virtually nothing about the Khazars, was perplexed at the fact that no Yiddish linguistic roots, whatever, could be traced to Western Europe. He also noted that inexplicably there was a large geographical gap, clearly de de delineating the Yiddish spoken by the Eastern Khazar transplants from any spoken in Western Europe. The evidence, Mr. Kessler nicely summates, adds up to a strong case in favor of those modern historians, whether Austrian, Israeli, or Polish, who, independently from each other, have argued that the bulk of modern Jewry is not of Palestinian, but of Caucasian origin. The mainstream of Jewish migrants, um, of migrations, did not flow from the Mediterranean, Mediterranean across France and Germany to the east and then back again. The stream moved in a consistently westerly direction from the Caucasus through 
the Ukraine into Poland and thence into Central Europe. When that unprecedented mass settlement in Poland came into being, there were simply not enough Jews around in the West to account for it, while in the East a whole nation was on the move to new frontiers. With the overwhelming evidence that the modern Jewry, Jewish population is of Khazar origin, Kessler remarks that this would clearly indicate that their ancestors <laughs> came not from the Jordan, but from the Volga, not from Canaan, but from the Caucasus, once believed to be the cradle of the Aryan race, and that genetically they were more closely related to the Hun. Now, Uyghur and Magyar tribes then to the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This conclusion would then logically render the epithet anti-Semitism void of meaning, Kessler says. And that's what I tell people is, you know, you believe a story because you heard the story, but you didn't really read the whole book. You know, if you read the whole thing or all the things that are, you know, available to us to, to look through, to see, what could this be instead of this constant freaking, oh, it's this, oh, it's that, this this addiction to affirmative, you know, you got to prove it, you got to show it, you got to believe it, you got to this and that, and you, you have to, have to, have to, have to, have to, and all that crap's all born from this shit that I'm reading. That's what I see is without organized religion and politics and education, what would we have? Why, we'd probably have a planet of very small groups of people that live a clean life and die. But this uh, overwhelming uh, greed to, englobe, to, uh, englobe, to enslave the globe as one shows itself in, the, in what you're looking at if you got that perspective to see it. And if you're a follower of all this crap, you're done. You know where to go. Argue, argue, argue. Hmm. That can't be true. My book says this. And my book says that. On and on and on. And never, it's never going to end. It's a game. It's designed to work the way it works. We're doing exactly what we're expected to do. Even me as an outsider. Nothing is a surprise to this game. This game was designed to do exactly as it does. Fuck us all equally. And if you don't believe that, a poor guy needs to find food. A rich guy needs to find people to protect his rich. See? So it's one slavery or another slavery. It doesn't matter. You're a, you're a slave to eating. You're a slave to protecting your, your stolen shit that you took from other people. They call it earning. I don't. I think selling... If, I've been involved in sales at levels of... Uh, Knowledge, I said, an insider knowledge of how it's done and what they pay for the things they sell. That wow, no people and the stories that salesmen tell potential you know customers to get them to buy. No, that some of this stuff is just done so badly. But if you're not in that world, then you don't know. If you're just a consumer and you're reading the advertisements and you're going with the stories, sucker. So. Let me get to the last of this here, and uh, let, where did I lead off? I think I said, uh, eh, void of meaning, yes. The latter conclusion is a position Palestinian Arabs might well dispute with Mr. Kessler, due to the fact that this revelation ironically places the modern Jew, currently occupying Palestine, in the unenviable position, uh, unenviable position of themselves being anti-Semitic, an historical mockery of somewhat amazing proportions. But what one may ask became of the greater part of the population of real Jews. Toward the close of the 9th century, the Jewish settlements of Germany, who were nearly all of Semitic origin, had been virtually wiped out by the mob hysteria that resulted from the First Crusade in 1096. The Encyclopedia Britannica on the Crusades vividly sets forth the mindset of the Crusaders. He might butcher all 
till he wadded ankle deep, waded ankle deep in blood, and then at nightfall kneel sobbing for ver for very joy at the altar of the sepulcher. I don't know how to read that sepulcher. It's some kind of weird. What is that? Uh, don't even know what language that's in. For was he not read from the winepress of the Lord? Oh, it's all that scripture crap. No wonder I can't read it. The Jews who found themselves in that winepress significantly assisted in their own demise, like those of Masada who committed mass suicide, rather than surrender to the armies of Rome. A great many of the Jews of the Rhineland and surrounding countries, when presented with the choice of baptism into Christianity or death at the hands of their captors, chose neither, opting for the Masada solution. Imitating on a grand scale Abraham's readiness to sacrifice Isaac, fathers slaughtered their children and husbands their wives. <clears throat> These acts of unspeakable horror and heroism were performed in the ritualistic form of slaughter with sacrificial knives <clears throat> sharpened in accordance with Jewish law. At times, the leading sages of the community uh, supervising the mass immolation were the last to part with the life at their own hands. <laughs> of course. In the mass hysteria, sanctified by the glow of religious martyrdom and compensated by the, compensated <laughs> by the e confident expectation of heavenly rewards, <laughs> nothing seemed to matter but to end life before one fell into the hands of the implicable foes and had to face the inescapable alternative of death at the enemy's hand or conversion to Christianity. Hmm. Freedom of religion, fuckers. That's what I'm telling you. How can you be free uh, to perform something that is so obviously forced on you somehow that if you don't accept this, you're a freaking weirdo. So don't be a freaking weirdo and better start learning this book. <laughs> That's how I see it. Anyway, <clears throat> of the German cities of Worms and Spires being somewhat representative of the whole of Western European communities that were devastated by the Crusades. Salo Baron writes, Salo, Salo, I don't know. The total Jewish population of either community had hardly exceeded the figures given for the dead alone. The most common historical concept before the modern revelation of the existence of Caesarea was that the 1096 crusade literally swept like a broom virtually the entire Jew German Jewish population into Poland. This was an invention of apparent necessity because those historians could account by no other means for the inexplicably large population of Eastern European Jews. They concluded this in the face of the total absence of any historical count of a mass migration of Jews to eastern Germany and certainly not Poland. By the close of the 13th, 1300s, much of Western Europe was, for all practical purposes, completely empty of any perceivable Jewish population. What the Crusades failed to accomplish in the eradication of Western European Jewry, the Black Death, the bubonic plagues of the Bas Bas Basili Pastorella Pestis, <laughs> virtually completed. Okay, those Jews of that era suffered doubly from the plague itself and from the proliferation of superstitious rumors that they were responsible for the disease by poisoning wells, just as they were blamed earlier for the ritual slaughter of Christian children. This resulted in the burning alive of Jews in great numbers over the whole of Europe. Later, some of the Sephardic Jews of Spain immigrated northward, accounting for the sum of the smaller Jewish populations of Western Europe. Because of the long and varied history of the Jews, says the 2001 edition of World Book Encyclopedia, it is difficult to define a Jew. There is no such thing as a Jewish race. Jewish identity is a mixture of religious, historical, and ethnic factors. Thus, those who might have truly claimed to be of the genealogy of Abraham and of true 
Semitic, Semitic origin. How do you say that fucking nonsense? Became extinct as a discernible race, being replaced by the whole by, by the white Khazars of the Transcaucasus. Wow. None of those ancestors, as Benjamin Friedman phrases it, have ever placed a foot in the land of Palestine. This causes a serious problem with modern Christian Christianity's in, uh, Christianity's infatuation with the Jews and their return to the homeland, begging the question. How can one return to a place where they have never been? Ah, finally got to the end of that. that. I enjoyed reading that, as hard as that was. Because I'm not very smart, Michael. I'm a, I'm a product of the 20th century. And I'm telling you, we had choices back in those days to do things uh, that we don't have choices to do any further. They're, they've all been taken. <clears throat> anyway. I'm going to type on the RLM. Um, that was fun, folks. And see if I get an answer. <laughs> Probably not, but <clears throat> 34 minutes left in, in a perfect world today. Because uh, I picked a big old honking huge link. I mean, the link of links. I picked the big one. The huge one. I had to do it in two shows. It was so big. It was huge! Sorry, guys. Just had a Trump moment. Let's see if... <gasps> Whoa, excuse me. Hiccup. T hiccup. I've got some fun stuff. I want to go... I'm going to go with uh, Israel again. And uh, I think I can do... I can read this and and interject and be all smartass on top of it and still finish the show within the confines of my allotted freedom time that uh, Grimner gives me to do the podcast with. And sometimes I go over, but eh, nobody really seems to care. We don't have enough traffic on the uh, radio to interrupt each other uh, at 2 in the morning on Monday night. So, mm. this epic, I think I'll post it too. I think I posted the other one. I don't know. Because there's very few people are going to bother to open a link at, what, 3.30 in the morning in America right now. I think that's on the East Coast. Uh <laughs> uh, oh yeah, I'm, uh, radio is fun, cowboy. Uh, but I'm gonna do one more. Uh, I'm typing and stalling simultaneously. But I'm typing to, to somebody that's actually on the RLM chat right now. That <laughs> I get along with a few people. I'm not a real popular guy. Some people just drive me nuts with their, you know, input. So I avoid it, <clears throat> and then I do shit like this, and they avoid me back. So it's all good. And this epic tale is called Israel's Role in 9/11, baby. Now, the ta the tale of 911 will just not go away, largely because it is clear to anyone who reads the lengthy 9/11 Commission report that many issues that should have been subject to inquiry were ignored for what would appear to be political reasons. The George W. Bush administration quite obviously did not want to assume any blame for what had happened, and that bias also extended to providing cover for U.S. allies, most particularly Saudi Arabia and Israel. Those who have sought the truth about 9-11 have been persistent in their attempts to find out information that was suppressed, but they have been blocked repeatedly in spite of numerous FOIA requests. There you go, request. <clears throat> Beg the killer <clears throat> to let you see the document used to prove that he was doing killing. Huh. Not going to happen. This was an attack by the enemy. People, don't you know anything? 18 years of war don't teach you shit, huh? Hmm. Speaking of which, now, 18 years after the event, there has been something like a breakthrough penetrating the wall of silence erected by the government. FBI reports on the possible Israeli role in 9-11 were released on May 7th, and they served to support speculation by myself and other former intelligence officers that Israel, at a minimum, 
had detailed prior knowledge of what was to take place. More than that, Israeli intelligence officers working in the United States might well have enabled certain aspects of the conspiracy. <laughs> conspiracy. To recount some of what is already known and suspected, one should first examine the 2016 release of a heavily edited and redacted 28 pages long annex to the 9-11 Commission report that explored the Saudi Arabian role in the terrorist attack. <laughs> this is fun. The, sec the section concluded that the Saudi government may have played a direct role in 9-11 by assisting two of the hijackers, including a dry run exercise ex intended to learn how to get into a plane's cockpit. There was also considerable evidence suggesting that wealthy Saudi and even members of the royal family had been supporting and funding Al-Qaeda. <laughs> what a bunch of crap all this is. Motherfuckers, they'll never tell us the truth about this. Got a little bit of truth in this with that hijacker crap, you know, and breaking in. What a bunch of nonsense. Good Lord. You ever been on a plane? I mean, people act like they've not, none of us that are down here on the ground have ever flown in a fucking plane to know that ain't going to happen. No, 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 no. That's It's a good story, but no. When somebody gets stupid on a fucking plane... You subdue them and you duct tape them to the fucking chair. You don't let them attack the damn cockpit. That's just stupid. So, we've got this nonsense. Anyway, back to my epic tale. <laughs> I tried not to rant, but I had to. <laughs> but far exceeding the Saudi role is the involvement of the Israeli intelligence service, Mossad, which was not subject to any serious inquiry or investigation by U.S. intelligence or police agencies. Israel, in spite of obvious involvement in 9-11, was not included in the 9-11 Commission report. Despite the existence of an, an enormous Israeli intelligence operation freely working in the United States, that was known to the FBI. <laughs> Some of those Mossad officers were notably filmed, celebrating as the Twin Towers were burning and collapsing. In the year 2001, Israel was running a massive spying operation throughout a num number of cover companies in New Jersey, Florida, and also on the West Coast that served as spying mechanisms for Mossad officers. Uh, the effort was supported by the Mossad station in Washington, D.C. and included a large number of volunteers. The so-called art students who traveled around the U.S. selling various products at malls, and outdoor markets. The FBI was aware of the numerous Israeli students who were routinely overstaying their visas, and some in the Bureau certainly believed that they were assisting their country's intelligence service in some way. But it proved it difficult to actually link the students to undercover operations, so they were regarded as a minor nuisance and were normally left to the tender mercies of the inspectors at the Bureau of Customs and Immigration. <laughs> oh, wow. American law enforcement was also painfully aware that the Israelis were running more sophisticated intelligence operations inside the United States, many of which were focused on Washington's military capabilities and intentions. Some specialized intelligence units concentrated on obtaining military and dual-use technology. It was also known that the Israeli spies penetrated the phone systems of the U.S. government to include those at the White House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what? The Jews run the White House. Fuck, get over it. You know, it's like all this truth stuff about all this. is some big secret. And they come right out. I've seen links uh, for I don't know how long about American senators and congressmen holding dual citizenship to Israel. Get rid of them. What the fuck are they doing? I mean, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, you, you don't get it. But uh, you can't be loyal to two enemy uh, to <laughs> you can't be loyal to two uh, governments. That's not, well, I was going to say enemies of the people, <laughs> but I didn't, and now I did. Anyway, this I, I, I. back to this in its annual classified counter espionage review. The FBI invariably places Israel at the top for friendly countries that spy on the U.S. In fact, the 
pre-9-11 bureau did its best to stay on top of that of the problem but it rarely received any political support from the justice department and white house if an espionage case involved israel or in israelis <clears throat> By one estimate, more than 100 such cases were not prosecuted for political reasons. Any Israeli caught on flagrant, uh, caught in flagrant, would most often be quietly deported, and most Americans who were helping Israel were let off with a slap on the wrist. But the hands-off attitude towards Israel shifted dramatically when, on September 11, 2001, a New Jersey housewife saw something from a window of her apartment building which overlooked the World Trade Center. She watched as, a buildings, as the buildings burned and crumbled, but also noted something strange. Three young men were kneeling on the roof of a white transit van parked by the water's edge, making a movie in which they featured themselves high-fiving and laughing in front of the catastrophic scene unfolding behind them. The woman wrote down the license plate number of the van and called the police, who responded quickly and soon both the local force and the FBI began looking for the vehicle, which was sub subsequently seen by other witnesses in various locations along the New Jersey waterfront, its occupants celebrating and filming. There is a crime to come. There, See, they're going to use that to justify the this new SCOTUS ruling about not being able to film the police. And then they just get old John and Mary, you know, average to nod their head and sign the paper. And, you know, the rest of us, they'll get with the implied consent because we're not made aware that these things are being passed into law to go up and say, hey, hey, don't do that. So, nah, it's a scam. We're being, we're being bent over a table, folks. But, hey, you don't have to believe that if you don't want to. I know, maybe you don't know, maybe you don't believe it, but if you can explain this in any other way, I'd sure like to know what it is. Hmm. Back to the story. The license plate number revealed that the van belonged to a New Jersey registered company called Urban Moving Systems. At 4 p.m., the vehicle was spotted and pulled over. Five men between the ages of 22 and 27 years old emerged and were detained at gunpoint and handcuffed. They were all Israelis. <clears throat> One of them had 4700 in cash hidden in his sock. No, he didn't. Hidden? No, that wouldn't be hidden. That would be like strapped to, you know. Huh, never mind. <clears throat> and another had two foreign passports. Bomb-sniffing dogs reacted to the smell of explosives in the van, which had very little actual moving equipment inside. According to the uh, initial police report, the driver, identified as Savan Kurz Kurzberg, stated, We are Israeli. We are not your problem. Your problems are our problems. The Palestinians are the, are the problem. The four other passengers were Sivan's brother, Paul Yeren Shmuel, Oded Elner, and Emmer Mar Mari. No, there's why I don't learn Danish. The men were detained at the Bergen County Jail in New Jersey before being transferred to, wait, transferred, transferred, the FBI's Foreign Counter Intelligence Section, which handles allegations of spying. After the arrest, the FBI obtained a warrant to search urban moving systems, Weehawken, New Jersey offices. Papers and computers were seized. The, uh, the company owner, Dominic Sutter, also an Israeli, answered FBI questions, but when a follow-up interview was set up a few days later, it was learned that he had fled the country for Israel, putting both his business and home up for sale. The office space and warehouse were abandoned. It was later learned that Sutter has been associated with at least 14 businesses in the United States, mostly in New Jersey and New York, but also in Florida. Sutter and his wife, oh, omit, <laughs> Omit Levinson Sutter were the owners of One Stop Cleaner located at Wellington, Florida, and Dominic was also associated, also associated with Basia McDonald, described as a Polish Holocaust survivor, as a business partner in yet another business called Value Add, 
Florida was a main focus for the Israeli intelligence operation in the U.S. that was directed against Arabs. The five, wow, this seems longer than I thought. The five Israelis were among 140 Israelis arrested after 9-11, most of whom had military backgrounds, including some who were trained at, in intelligence. The five were held in Brooklyn, initially on charges relating to visa fraud. FBI interrogators questioned them for more than two months. Several were held in solitary confinement so they could not communicate with each other, and two of them were given repeated polygraph exams, which they failed when claiming that they were... Hold on a second here. They were nothing more than students working summer jobs. The two men that the FBI focused on most intensively were believed to be Mossad staff officers and the other three were volunteers helping with surveillance. The Israelis were not exactly cooperative, but the FBI concluded from documents obtained at their office in Weehawken that they were targeting Arabs in New York and New Jersey most particularly in the Patterson, New Jersey area. Boy, there's a place to stay out of Patterson, which has the second largest Muslim, well, I didn't know that, Muslim population in the U.S. They were particularly interested in local groups possibly linked to Hamas, Hezbollah, as well as in charities that might be used for fundraising. The FBI also concluded that the Israelis had actually monitored the activities of at least two of the 9-11 hijackers. There were no 9-11 hijackers, fuckers. That's just a bunch of crap. But you'll get it someday or you won't. To be sure, working on intelligence operations does not necessarily imply participation in either the planning or execution of something like 9-11. But there are Israeli fingerprints all over the place with cover companies and intelligence personnel often intersecting with locations frequented by the hijackers. Apart from the interrogations of the five men from Weehawken, the U.S. government has apparently never sought to find out what else the Israelis might have known or were up to in September to 2011. Huh. There are a lot of dots that might well have been connected once upon a time, but the trail has grown cold. Police records in New Jersey and New York were where the men were held have disappeared, and FBI interrogation reports have been inaccessible. Media coverage of the case also died. Though the five were referred to in the press as the Dancing Israelis, and by the sum, more disparagingly as the Dancing Shlomos. Yeah, well, yeah, funny, haha. Huh? Inevitably, the George W. Bush White House, after 71 days in detention, the five Israelis were released from prison by Attorney General John Ashcroft, put on a plane and deported. Two of the men were later spoke about their unpleasant experience in America on an Israeli talk show, one explaining that their filming the fall of the Twin Towers was to document the event. In 2004, the five men sued the United States government for damages alleging that their detention was illegal and that their civil rights were violated, suffering racial slurs. Physical violence, religious discrimination, rough interrogations, deprivation of sleep, and many other offenses. They were re represented by Nitsana Darshan Leitner, who in the previous year had founded the Shuret Hayden Israel Law Center, which seeks to bankrupt groups that Israel considers to be terrorists. <sighs> Shooter at head and is closely tied to the Israeli government. Hmm. Well, informative. Now, it is just possible that the urban, mo urban moving Israelis were indeed in uninvolved in 9 11, but nevertheless working for Mossad, which the Israeli government even sub subsequently admitted. But the new evidence suggests that the Israelis had almost had considerable prior knowledge and were likely involved in what happened. 
The new information, bullshit. It's the same fucking old information they had since the goddamn thing happened. The new information reveals that minutes after the first plane struck the World Trade Center, five Israelis had taken a position in the parking lot at the Doric apartment complex in Union City, New Jersey, where they took pictures and filmed the attacks while also celebrating the fall of the towers and high-fiving. One eyewitness interviewed by the Bureau had seen the Israelis' van circling the building parking at 8 a.m. that day, more than 40 minutes prior to the attack, indicating prior knowledge of what was about to happen. Uh, okay, more or less. I mean, depends on how you look at it. The eyewitness testimony is supported by copies of photos taken by men, by the men that the FBI seized. Whew. The photo reproductions were obtained via a FOIA request made by a private citizen and are of poor quality. Well, there's your request stuff, people. Deliberately made so by the FBI uh, to conceal faces and other details. They constitute only 14 of over 70 photos taken by the Israelis. Nevertheless, they clearly demonstrate that a celebration was going on. One photo in intriguingly shows Kurzberg holding a lit lighter in front of the Manhattan skyline on September 10th, one day before 9-11. It was apparently taken at the Doric complex on a reconnoitering visit made by made on that day and suggests that Kurzberg was simulating the attack on the towers on the following day. Why would Israel do it? Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu described 9-11 initially as a good thing. He was later quoted as saying somewhat more expansively, we are benefiting from one thing, and that is the attack on the Twin Towers and Pentagon, and the American struggle in Iraq. To be sure, 9-11 was a gift to Israel, and it is a gift that keeps on giving. America is at war in a number of Muslim countries, and its troops blanket the Middle East, to include a base in Israel dedicated to the defense of that country. It is all a result of global war on terror. And the GWOT started with 9-11. And it just maybe it was fire that was ignited by Israel. Just maybe. I don't doubt it. I'm a believer of the uh, usually the opposite of what everybody else thinks. I think that. Sometimes uh, I'm accused of, yeah, you're just trying to be difficult. But I don't know. Maybe I am. Maybe I'm not. But those are the, the two links that I decided to uh, follow up with finish on this in a perfect world podcast here at the end is this the last the last podcast day i might not be let me look at the date here uh yep the next time you hear my wonderful voice on in a perfect world it will be the month of july and uh that month is very important to the people that i grew up with oh i even uh they don't celebrate the fourth of july Anywhere but in America, in case you guys didn't know that, because some people don't seem to get that. I traveled with somebody to um, Scotland, and when the 4th of July came, oh, well, there's no, no, there isn't. We're in Scotland. <laughs> so there you go. But 4th of July is coming. <laughs> Will we see another 4th of July? Fireworks in the sky and people getting drunk and, you know, loving each other a long time and doing all the wonderful stuff they do to each other uh, for no particular reason. But I'm going to try to do my notes while I'm finishing up on this epic in a perfect world solo podcast. Because, um, well, there shouldn't, I don't expect too many people to be awake, for one, listening. <laughs> And for, oh, I can do it like that. I can copy and paste and be so clever with this internet stuff. It makes me look like I know what I'm doing. Uh, but I'll send these notes to Grim, and uh, he'll post the show for the uh, the podcast for later. And whoever didn't hear me that does want to will be able to pick up. The podcast, so you can be an enlightened member of society. Because that's what we're looking for here. 
enlighten members of society, especially on Real Liberty Media. But, well, you get what you pay for. Hmm. So I guess I'll go with the, uh, thanks a lot. I saw Cowboy Tech, and I saw Rome's, and I saw, I think, Gooberzilla on the chat, on and off. But I was spent most of the time just reading. Doing my 2 o'clock in the morning podcast for, uh, <laughs> I guess, BitChute. Wherever else Grim manages to uh, put the podcast out to. And he's done his share of work. And I'd still, Grim, if you do catch the show, I'm interested in learning how to help you do the stuff on the other two sites that you were talking about. Because I've got three days a week where I don't do anything uh, radio you know, oriented. So I've got free time if I plan ahead and make it. If you want to sit down at a specific time, good for you. And try to work with me and see if I can't learn how to do some of the stuff. I'll, I'll try to help you with it. And what have we got coming up? We have, I think Mary's back. The, the last shows I did, I forgot she, uh, last Friday, Thursday show. I forgot she was gone for Friday and I was promoting her anyway. But I think she's back. Eh, I think she'd be back to normal. Anyway, so as a rule on the reallibertymedia.com radio, we've got on Wednesday and Friday night at 7 o'clock on the East Coast for your perusal, Graham Z and the Rocket Chair Podcast. At 7 o'clock East Coast. And then on uh, Thursday, wait, let's see, Thursday night, I come in at 2 o'clock on the East Coast, which is my evening time, and I do a, a thing I call 20% off. Now, that totally solo. The, everything else I've been doing, I, I do Dork Table and this with Vinny. And uh, I consider that, you know, you doing it with other people. But the Thursday night thing, I do solo. And, uh, Again, Friday night after Graham Z on the rocket chair, 11 o'clock on the East Coast, Grim and Moose Girl do the Freakers Ball. Now, Saturday, I do the dork table at noon East Coast, usually with Vincent lately, but it used to be Mary. And uh, sometimes they're fun. Sometimes, wow, you never know what to make of what me and Vinny are going to talk about. Sunday morning, Grimner opens up with the blues, plays the blues in the trivia trivia into Hal Anthony. So if you're a trivia player, I play sometimes. I don't play every week. Sometimes it's really hard to beat these guys. They get frustrated. So uh, Hal Anthony, 3 o'clock on the East Coast, comes from behind the woodshed. Whip a little whoop ass on the crickets. And then uh, Monday, 7 o'clock on, that's 3 p.m. on the East Coast for Hal Anthony. And uh, Monday on 7 o'clock on the East Coast, Grim Leftovers. That's what he does with the links that he didn't get to in his previous show with Moose, uh, the Freaker's Ball. And then he just does the uh, up, up and coming stories that he didn't get time to finish. And then next Tuesday morning, 2 a.m. on the East Coast, I'll try to come back with another exciting, thrill packed episode of In a Perfect World. And Vinny threatens to get up and join me, but he never does because this is really, really late. I think it's like 4 o'clock in the morning where he's at. So, thanks everybody that played and didn't play, and uh, we'll get back to you next week. In the meantime, uh, you know, try to just do what you can and enjoy yourself. Bye. <laughs>